My name is Suneha. I am a research affiliate with the Dakshin Foundation, and uh, we are very, very excited to bring together uh, uh, this very cool panelist, uh, panel discussion for you all today. Just to give you a quick introduction as to why we are doing this and why we decided to um, go ahead and put together this panel discussion is that uh, we have, it's come to, it's no longer a secret to anyone that diving is becoming a very, very popular water sport. And it's sort of functioning as a way to introduce a lot of different kinds of people to the ocean. And uh, this also increases their sense of environmental responsibility and their commitment to conservation and sustainability. So keeping that in mind, we believe that this is a perfect time to sort of leverage uh, the existing energy for action amongst the diving community, as well as invite non-divers to try out the sport and use that as a medium to sort of connect with the ocean and connect with nature. So before we proceed with introducing our speakers for the day, I would like to just share a few basic guidelines. I'm sure this is not anybody's first uh, Zoom uh, panel discussion or webinar anymore, so I'll keep this part very short. Please keep yourselves on mute. If you feel comfortable sharing your video, please go ahead, but please make sure you are on mute. Um, we will be asking, I will be moderating today's discussion and posing questions to our speakers, but we welcome you all to uh, pose your questions as well. If you have any questions at any point, please enter it on the chat box to your right of your screen. And if it's to a particular speaker, please make sure you mention that speaker. So we will also be able to pose the question directly to the speaker um, of your choice. Uh, we will be having a question and answer session after our panelists have spoken, where, we, uh, where you are more than welcome to turn on your cameras and audios to ask the questions to the speakers yourselves. Um, at this point, I do would like to remind everyone, however, to uh, please refrain from talking over one another. Please um, just put up, use your um, icon to show your hand up on the Zoom webinar chat, and uh, I will be able to pick out um, some of the people whom we have time for, and you can participate in the discussion yourselves. Um, apart from that, there are no particular rules or discussions. There's no, not going to be any presentations today. We will just be having a bit of an informal chat. Um, to now introduce our um, amazing speakers for the evening, uh, we first have Sejal, who's a writer, and she's also been working with the Marine Life of Mumbai. So over to you, Sejal, to give yourself a quick introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Suneha. Uh, it's not very common for uh, intertidal folks to be part of a diving uh, webinar, so this is super. I'm really proud that MLM is part of discussions like this. Um, so I'm an independent writer and editor. I've worked in publishing uh, for like over 19 years. And over the last four years, I've been doing science communication for Marine Life Mumbai and building their online and offline outreach and uh, just uh, ensuring that uh, citizens of Bombay fall in love with the ocean. And um, I also do other writing on the side. Um, I write about uh, travel, environment. I write fiction. and um, uh, children's books as well and I hate uh, doing this introduction thing so I'm going to pass this on to Mariam, uh, Suneha, back to Suneha actually. <laughs> yes please Mariam, you can more than welcome to pass it on to Mariam, please Mariam go ahead. And... Hey thanks Sejal, thanks uh, Suneha, um, I'm Mariam, I'm a scuba diving instructor and I'm uh, rather uh, feeling privileged to be on this panel with uh, some peers from the field and uh, people that I have seen from a distance and also seen work closely uh, in the Andamans. Um, I've been diving now for about nine years. And uh, yeah, so I guess I'm going to be here to tell those of you that don't know what diving is, a little bit more about why you should dive. And um, uh, it is uh, really amazing because we do have a lot of programs where intertidal is becoming a massive part, even for folks that are diving, because as long as it's by the sea, it's uh, all one. Uh, over to you, Suneha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sejal and Mariam. Now we will have Kartik introduce himself from Dakshin Foundation. Uh, uh, thanks, Suneha. So, uh, well, actually, I'm, my day job is as faculty at the Indian Institute of Science, where I work on evolutionary ecology of um, Lots of terrestrial and marine animals, frogs, lizards, snakes, reef fish, and so on. Um, 
I also work with closely with Dakshin on our programs related to flagships, as well as more recently community well-being. Uh, and like Sejal, I dabble in writing children's fiction. Uh, I dabble, she does it seriously. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, uh, Kartik. Can we, uh, we'd also like to introduce to you all Vardhan, who's been uh, working as a researcher for a very, very long time. Can you please have uh, Vardhan, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Vinaya, for the invitation. Yeah, hello, everyone, and uh, nice to see many familiar play, uh, faces here. I'm uh, Vardhan, and I'm a marine biologist by training. Uh, and I've been working on a range of uh, projects uh, over the past few years. Uh, most of my work has been in Andaman Nicobar Islands, but I've also worked um, in Lakshadweep uh, at Grand Island in Goa, in uh, Dwarka in Gujarat, uh, Gulf of Banar, Nitrani, um, and of course, not uh, last but not the least, uh, Angria Bank, where recently we went for the expedition. Uh, currently, I'm working with Wildlife Conservation Society, and I head their marine program, um, where I share responsibility for research, capacity building, funding, partnership, and so on. Um, and um, we're working on five broad themes, which is coral reef, marine protected areas, sustainable fisheries, marine mammals, and sharks in the race. So I'm happy to be here and to talking to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vardhan. And last but not the least, can we please have Umid, which I'm sure most of you might already be familiar with his work, but can you please also give yourself a quick introduction? Hi, everyone. My name is Umid, and um, I love to dive. I've been doing it since 1996 when I first fell in love with it. And uh, I think one of my, I've overlapped a lot with uh, all the people on this panel in various capacities, either as a dive instructor or as a photographer or uh, uh, tagging along with them when they're uh, tagging leatherbacks in little andamans and things like that. So I've been actually very privileged and very fortunate to uh, be able to Venn diagram with all of these amazing people. And uh, I hope I can add some amount of value to uh, this conversation purely from the fact that uh, I've been watching this Indian Ocean space uh, change uh, and evolve over the last 20 years. And uh, it's quite fascinating. So, uh, and I'm super excited for reflog actually. <laughs> so are we all. <laughs> so uh, we will be giving you all a quick idea as to our um, motivations of starting reflog, but that is a little bit later into the panel discussion. Uh, what I would like to start off is posing a question to two of our most experienced researchers on the panel today who are Kartik as well as Vardhan. So you both in various different capacities and different sort of research interests have been working uh, towards marine conservation or conservation oriented research for at least for easily over a decade or two now. So in your opinion, uh, Vardhan, do you believe that um, our efforts in India in, for marine conservation compares to our terrestrial conservation efforts in any way? Or is it as good? Is it not as good? Or what, what are your opinions on this? Mm, yeah, uh, thank you. That's an interesting question. Uh, but I'm, as a researcher, I would certainly say that lack of data is the biggest sort of challenge. Uh, uh, because the wildlife science itself is a relatively new field. And marine science and marine conservation is even new. Uh, and uh, as you rightly said, in last 10, 20 years, we have started exploring our seas. And while people have been exploring the forest for now almost for 30, 40 years, uh, uh, we have began to explore our seas only last uh, around 10, 20 years. Uh, and other, uh, as compared to land, uh, our conservation effort are limited because, uh, because of the time you get. You get a very limited time. Uh, you can get uh, you get to spend underwater. You can just with one tank you get a few uh, minutes uh, and less than an hour or so you get. Uh, plus, it's logistic nightmare. You have to carry so many things if you want to conduct research. There's so much planning that goes in if you want to conduct any underwater research. Um, uh, and this is while I'm talking about research as such or marine conservation as such, I'm talking about the uh, uh, system that I work, which is on coral reefs. Uh, but overall, what Sejal is working on 
overall because it's a, it's a new field and only even now there are new species new crab species new new riverbank species that is getting described every day uh, it's it's i'm very happy that there are many more people who are interested in diving many people are actually uh, taking uh, even there are so many courses that are um, uh, now that that are offering marine science as, and marine biology as a degree uh, so that's a, that's a great thing and uh, uh, of course there is lots of effort is required lack of capacity uh, lack of uh, manpower and uh, lack of our ability to transform data mean into meaningful science is i would say that uh, is a, one of the other biggest uh, limitation um, and uh, moving forward hopefully we will be able to set up strong uh, uh, monitoring platform uh, where we can record uh, data of, available from our system we have almost 8000 km coastline we have uh, millions of people who depend on the coastline we have 2.2 square km of ez and our ez which is exclusive economic zone is virtually is not been explored to the fullest potential while there are organization like cmlre cmfri they have capacity i think there is lot more that needs to go in and uh, i think uh, uh, even if you are not trained biologist not trained researchers uh, you can contribute in multi ways uh, and uh, there are very many platforms that are available and i'm glad that uh, this discussion is happening and there i mean there's a whole this larger uh, community of marine conservationists who are emerging and hopefully uh, that will help uh, in conservation of our system thanks, thanks uh, vardhan i think you brought up some very very interesting points over there one of them being the fact that there is a lack of data and the difficulty in in being able to turn all the data that we collect as researchers into conservation science or action now kartik you've sort of been involved in uh, both the research aspect of it through iisc and the conservation aspect of it through dakshin so do you want to shed a bit of light in terms of the challenges involved in the process of collecting data and then turning that into conservation because i think we know that they exist uh, separately but it would be good to hear from someone who's done it how they come together in action sure uh, I, i think i'll answer those questions uh, you know sort of maybe address them a little separately to begin with uh, and you know as valdan said uh, the history of uh, research in in india has sort of uh, focused on terrestrial ecosystems especially since the 70s you know since with very good intention you know the government of india prime minister indira gandhi sort of promoted the idea of you know of the conservation of you know tigers and other sort of endangered um, fauna uh, but it kind of really took uh, it, it it took attention away or it focused attention on terrestrial systems terrestrial animals you know tigers elephants uh, and and so on uh, and work that had actually been done in india before that by marine biologists some of which was some some of it's quite pioneering work at a global scale in the 50s and the 60s it sort of like it, it really sort of disappeared over the next few decades uh, and even though there are a few strongholds of marine research um, a few departments and a few universities that that still uh, and national institutions that promote uh, marine research it's really kind of it's it, it disappeared from the mainstream of ecological evolutionary research over the last few decades and it's beginning to come back to the fore only now um with you know there's this talk of setting up national you know marine biology institutes and uh, sort of uh, cutting edge biological and e- ecological research and so on uh, I, i think the the thing to keep in mind is that uh, and the kind of the link back to conservation is that the, the 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 ironically the reason it's come to the fore is is not because of not perhaps because uh, uh i would say not largely because people have suddenly realized how fascinating marine biology is but how much uh, you know marine resources uh, are a source for you know marine biotechnology pharmaceutical products and so you know marine bioprospecting is one of the reasons it's kind of like all of a sudden back in the forefront of everybody's uh, mind uh, regardless of the reasons i think that you know marine research is beginning to sort of come out again similarly on a similar trajectory from the 70s sort of stemming from in almost the same kind of like uh sort of national level uh agendas uh conservation also sort of ended up getting uh, really focused in terrestrial areas uh and terrestrial conservation in india uh like in other like like uh, you know stemming from other parts of the world has been very exclusionary has been a sort of protected area approach where you know you throw you know remove people from areas uh, on the philosophy that uh, that humans are not a part of nature and and um you know that 
uh, the way to protect uh, wildlife or the environment or ecology is by having these pristine reserves, uh, which derives both from sort of our own history of, uh, you know, of, of protection from, uh, you know, earlier periods, uh, the British sort of colonial legacy, as well as sort of a Western legacy of uh, wilderness, which originated in North America in the early 20th century. So it's very interesting that, that marine conservation also languishes, but on the other hand, marine, um, uh, the sustainability of marine systems or marine uh, management is slightly more inclusive because it's mostly sort of governed by these fishery regulation laws rather than the sort of wildlife laws that were implemented. So these are these two independent sort of trajectories of research and conservation that have, that have both languished uh, and are both sort of beginning to emerge more. Uh, and I think both of them have very, you know, at the same time where we can sort of uh, say that, you know, there's uh, that, that we need to pay attention to both. I think both have some interesting elements to them in ways in which they're sort of different from terrestrial conservation. And so as, as long ago as, you know, maybe 15 years ago, uh, Arthi Sridhar and I wrote an article saying that, you know, it's not that marine conservation in India has to learn from terrestrial conservation. But actually, terrestrial conservation should learn from the marine paradigms because the marine paradigms are already more interactive, inclusive, and uh, incorporated elements of uh, you know sustainability and livelihoods and so on. So, uh, so I think we're in an interesting juncture. So I'm I, I, not really answering your question about how can you bring those two together because I think that's a that is the challenge that's up ahead of us. But I, I'm hoping that provides a bit of context for that challenge. So that definitely does provide that much needed context to sort of take away, take away in our personal lives as well as to move forward with this discussion today. And uh, keeping that in mind, I want to bring in uh, Sejal's opinion about, you know, we've, we've been talking about how conservation has not always been inclusive, but uh, through your work with MLOM, you guys have managed to not just... Um, you know, open people up to the concept of intertidal species, but also bring people really closer to nature, perhaps uh, subconsciously or consciously, it's promoted this sort of model of inclusive exploration of nature and understanding what that is. Could you shed a little bit more light on what your sort of uh, views were when you took such a unique path in terms of how MLOM started and how it's sort of, it's been four years now and how it's sort of uh, evolved to what it is today? Um, yeah, so uh, in Bombay, especially more than, and this might be true for a lot of coastal cities, but uh, if you know Bombay and you live in Bombay, uh, you'd realize that um, unless you actively work with the ocean, uh, you have a very strange relationship with, uh, with it, in that you forget it's there. Uh, this vast expanse of water uh, exists, but you are immersed in the daily struggles of your life in the city and you kind of forget. So four years ago, when Siddharth and Pradeep sir and Abhishek started MLOM, uh, their explicit purpose was to bring people closer to the shore and meet these neighbors who are these incredible animals that you would not expect to see in Bombay. There are octos and jellies and uh, moody brands and sea stars. And so yes, people came to see those, but they also saw the coastline and they saw the architecture of the coast and they saw the history of the rocks. And they saw the livelihood of the people who depend on the coast. And in that, I think what happened is that uh, it strengthened their understanding of where they live. And um, I did a story uh, in Goa and this amazing teacher, Priya Sule, she once told me that a small measure of sustainability is how much you transact within your pin code. And uh, that made so much sense to me as MLOM literally citizens looked into their watery backyard and saw this ecosystem that they shared with these creatures that are struggling and thriving, not unlike us, like we're also struggling and thriving in this city. So I think that kind of kinship that formed with uh, the creatures that inhabit the inside and then of course the ocean um, became very powerful, I think. And that, um, and I would actually always, and this is something I always say that I think the team that came together to start the communication process at that time um, was very instrumental in what MLOM was able to achieve because it was such a motley crew of people. Uh, we, are as, we were as different as we could be. Like there were bankers and there were artists and writers and illustrators and uh, people who were just random enthusiasts, students, and of course, marine biologists. 
So everyone came in with this different mindset and everyone had very strong opinions, sometimes too strong and it was not always easy. But uh, it was amazing because that somehow built that foundation for how we should communicate science to citizens in a way that might be fun, it was filled with humor, it was relatable, that you have a band, you have a band, you know, you learn to coexist together and that sort of, uh, that sort of relatability uh, came through in our content and I think it had such a profound effect on the team and which is why it had such a profound effect on the people we also spoke to about uh, the coast and ultimately if and this is something that is again very true for Bombay I think if you know the city you know that when you go out your line of vision is always obstructed like there are buildings and there are people and you're constantly dodging your life in Bombay so, and I've literally seen this with our participants who come for shore walks with us, that they step onto the ocean, uh, to the shore from the road, and you can see them visibly take this gulp of air, and they're like, oh my god, because somehow, like, until the eye can see, there is vastness, which in Bombay is like a, it's a dream. So, when you come to the shore, and then you see people engage with something that they have only experienced in childhood, because then they've forgotten about it. And then to go in and see these creatures that... Uh, they were always there. People have been working on the coast, but it has not been open in a way that is accessible to a large public. And uh, that, I think, was um, somewhere that MLOM could manage to do that. And it breaks through the flutter, breaks the wildlife bubble that we always struggle to break out of. And I think it was because the team was so diverse internally, I think our communication was able to be a little more powerful externally. And then it led to INAT and, um, you know, all of those things which brought a little structure to, um, to our sightings because people started to then upload. Would you like to, would you like me to talk about INAT as well? Yes, please, please, of course. Yeah, because it's very exciting to me what I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with Reflog because, uh, so INAT is very different in that sense. And I think uh, Naveen had, uh, there was a citizen science conference, Naveen had actually talked about how different projects uh, work in different ways for citizen science, right? Not one one thing can't work for everything. And uh, some some might be very targeted projects, some might be open in terms of, for MLOM, for example, it was always about outreach. It was always about telling people this is there. And then that information, when it's structured in a way that we have two uh, projects on iNaturalist, which is Marine Life in Mumbai and Interfairy Biodiversity of India. And here it becomes structured and verified by global experts and we tell everybody on our walks and everybody's been uploading and the community is really growing. And uh, this is where it's uh, important because the information is there for you to use. So in an ideal world, scientists could use it, students could use it, educators could use it. In a utopian world, even authorities could use it to you know, try and see what to make of our cities. So the idea behind MLOM was open and accessible. Might all, not always work for other projects, but for this specific project, it was necessary that it reached every person who wanted to use it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been traveling, so I haven't seen the last figures. Maybe Abhishek, if he's around, he can probably put it in the chat box. The kind of observations that are going, um, people are... Uh, it's becoming a community of people who, you know, how you go into a forest and you hear people say, kya dikha, tiger dikha, ye dikha, ye dikha. So people literally, when they type pool and they're coming back and saying, kya dikha, kya dikha, and they'll say octopus, and they're like, oh my God, octopus, on which show tomorrow we'll go. So it's become like, uh, it's become a very interesting sort of um, data collection. It's not just in the way that I imagine data collection would be. Uh, it's a lot more um, inclusive. I think, and it's open for so many people to say, ha, come now, come for a show work and upload on INAT. And that's the, uh, you know, the war cry of the team that upload on INAT, upload on INAT. And you somewhere, you know, uh, and you break that barrier that you think that, oh, it's a scientific thing, I don't want to do it. But you break that barrier and say, if you upload on INAT, it's a global database. Somewhere, someone is looking at your photo, no matter how unscientific you might have wanted it to be, but they are looking at your photo and now they know this thing exists. So I think that's very powerful to talk to people about me. And I think we wanted to keep it simple. And I think uh, that's, I think that is the strength that MLOM could achieve with that simplicity. So um, Sejal, I think one thing that's very striking about what you mentioned is that it's always been about people. It's about, it's been about introducing people to literally something that's been on their own backyard for, for as long as we've been alive and definitely longer. But 
um, unfortunately, not everyone has sort of that luxury of being in cities like like Chennai or Bombay, where you know you just have to take a bus to reach the ocean. So, um, Mariam, you have been introducing people and Umid as well. So, you guys, as instructors, have sort of been introducing people um, to the ocean through diving, right? So, what I want to hear from you, uh, Mariam, would be how do you think? Do you see like an attitude shift? between someone say from bangalore or delhi and you know they have probably seen the ocean only on a holiday once or twice in their lives and they take their first breath uh, underwater and see that kind of marine life that uh, you know they only thought they'd see on national geographic or discovery channel and to actually see that in real life what impact do you think that has on you know your students psyche or their attitude well um, so it is actually a very fair point. Most, uh, as 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 uh, as a as a people, we are often told to stay away from the sea, stay away from the water because you'll die. So um, when I first started diving, I had uh, one of my senior instructors who very openly used to say that he didn't quite enjoy teaching advanced courses. It's, it's, it's a form of a, a course, or like taking fun divers out. And I and I couldn't understand why he would make a statement like that because it was so much easier to do as a dive professional. But over the years and with as recent as what happened with my last couple of courses, right? Uh, which was, um, one was in Karnataka and one was in the Maldives, very different regions, uh, uh, very different uh, marine life, very different topographies, very different conditions. But the reaction, however, is the same. Uh, there were some uh, Discover Scuba divers. They were a guy that is, People who are doing it for the first time uh, don't necessarily need to know how to swim or any of the other technical stuff. And then there were guys who were doing the course. But the reaction is always the same, which is wow. Like, wow. Right? Um, I had a student recently asking me because I'd gone for a snorkeling session and I came back and they're like, What did you see? I was like, I saw one hermit crab you know, leave his shell to get into another shell because his shell was old and, you know, he was getting into a new shell. And I was like, I've never seen that. And they laughed. They're like, what dives you have? 5,000 dives. You've never seen hermit crab changing shells and you're getting all excited. And I was like, and yeah, you see, that's the point. No matter how much you do this, you always see something new. And, and when people come from mainland India, especially from inland, and, and then they see this, for them, they start to make relations. And, and, and here, where I have this little thing of, you know, picking up stuff as I go along. And um, whether it's plastic or whatever, some stuff that doesn't belong there. And very often, I've had people ask me questions like, Ye kahan se aaya? Because a lot where I live and work is in the Andamans, a lot of stuff that comes to our shows isn't from mainland India. And then people go, Ye kahan se? and you're like, Thailand, they're like, but Thailand to waha hai. So, it, and that's when the, you know, the, the connection goes, you see, it, it all connects. It, it can start in point A, but it all comes back to the sea, right? Like we come from the sea and we go back to the sea. So everything just, and then, and then you see their brains frying up and they're like, you know what? I will throw stuff in a dustbin. I will go home and learn how to swim. Like it's very small connections. Right? I'm not, I'm not making, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing what a lot of other people are doing on this panel, but it's, it's all about making that connection with people. Like Sejal said, it's connecting the dots, right? Like it's, it's, it's making them say, you don't have to have a degree. You don't need to have a scientific mind to understand how the world functions. You just need to understand that it's all connected. Like it, it all comes together somewhere. How does this happen? You know, it's, it's very simple stuff. But uh, I'll actually let Umid speak a little bit more about it because he, he is actually somebody who introduced me to Marine Life of Mumbai like some two years ago while we were having a coffee in a place in uh, Bangalore and we were moving to Goa about what these guys are doing about, you know, making that connection. And as long as I've known Umid, Umid's all about connecting the dots. So I'm going to actually let him take it from here. Umid, all yours. But what is the question? If, uh, if the question is, uh, has diving <laughs> opened up uh, awareness? The answer is without a doubt. 
and i would say the acceleration of that has been mm-hmm. even if, if you want to shorten the time span it's been even just over the last 10 years i would say and if you see the combination of uh, diving facebook and instagram uh, <clears throat> that trajectory has been exponential uh, uh, if 10 years ago i was started taking photographs or in 2005 i started taking photographs because people didn't understand where i was working and why i would go out to an island now uh, you've got somebody's uncle who's posting on facebook of a dive that he did with a manta ray or somebody's cousin who's posting on instagram of uh, a, you know a shore walk that he did and so this combination of the opening up of diving in india the more people doing it and social media the awareness in general if you if you were to take that what it uh, ends up achieving and things like that is different but the awareness in general has exploded for sure so taking back from what you guys are talking about where in terms of the awareness of any average person whether they are it's increasing because they're going on a show walk or whether it's increasing because of diving uh but then how how would you think that the scientific community can sort of leverage this increased awareness not just because of diving but the combination like omit says of diving plus social media as sort of researchers as part of the scientific community how can we make use of this increased level of awareness and make change that from someone who's just enjoying nature to someone who actually wants to actively contribute to its conservation you're muted Yeah. i would say one way to go about it is uh, of course uh, it's great that if you have a system in place where which uh, consolidates this information and there are platforms like ebird and this is i think that ties to this whole reflog initiative which is if you if you are just uploading a poster and uh, on instagram and trying and just uh, go, uh, getting high by a number of likes that's one part of the story but i think uh, if you take one step beyond where you uh because uh, many time when you write about the any or when you post also you end up reading about the species you end up uh, looking online you uh, end up looking on wikipedia and uh, no matter uh, if you know if you're a commoner or if you're uh, just a enthusiast you end up doing that because you want to post that and when you do that you are in a way learning about the species so there is that individual benefit that you are really learning about the species you are trying to understand what they do their ecology their environment and how they interact with their uh, surrounding that is one part of the story second is that if there is this information how do you take it and make it useful so that we can protect the species mm-hmm. or we can protect the habitat and in order to do that if you we have platforms uh, such as reflock or uh, for birds there is this uh, ebird where people upload and then there are data scientists who churn data and in today's world metadata is a big thing and essentially uh, as umi rightly pointed out because of social media there are people every minute i'm sure there are so many uh, people posting on different platforms including i naturalist if there is a uh, uh, if data scientists can churn this information if they, they can get this information and make uh, mean, uh, mean, meaning out of it that would, that is great and i think that's what that's what the scientific community should leverage the uh, the uh, advantage that we have today that so many species are getting reported every now and then and i know many of my friend who are also in this panel such as sudanshu who have described many uh, nudibranch species and uh, there are people who have described crab species uh, they see this post somewhere and there are on facebook there are these uh very interesting forums where you can just upload your picture and then people id and there are experts who uh, scientists are there and they immediately id the advantage is it doesn't stop there people go there they uh, then you can get into personal chat you can find out where did you see the species uh, what was the location um, uh, and uh, other few details and actually scientists are going and trying to report the species and uh, that is uh, uh, really great i feel because uh, uh, that is that that is that what i was saying that there is a second step where you are not just individually benefiting by getting high off like but you are going one step beyond where you are really uh, making difference and of course uh, by publishing it doesn't end but the more we talk about it the more when we say that this is a critically endangered species which is found here it really there is a and if there is some mega project that is coming up then you can uh, you have a case so and uh, uh, what mlom do, was doing is a one great example because they reported many sclerotinian species uh, in mumbai and when this coastal road was coming up the good thing is that 
many of them ash under schedule one of the indian wildlife protection now this is a complete different ball game and uh, it will require different uh, panel discussion to whether uh, it was uh, uh if whether it was useful or not but at least there was who ha and there was pil's file and the information that mlom researchers and uh, enthusiasts they collected was used so i think that's where uh, uh i would summarize that as a researcher it's great that there is this huge community and there are people who are supporting the initiative and that can uh, help in documenting and then in conservation that's uh, that brings up a very in my head at least the light bulb here is that social media does clearly have a play role to play here in terms of whether we're highlighting what we see or what we do with this information but uh, karthik do you see any challenges in terms of involving social media and uh, citizen science do you think there's a potential there could be potential challenges here or you think it's just all good to go did you did you ask me about social media i just mean <laughs> I know it's the so, wrong question. I just want to point out that when you said you know Vardhan Karthik, you've been working on like you know whatever marine stuff for a decade or so, you you were off by like a couple of like you know. Couple of decades. <laughs> yeah, a couple of decades. <laughs> I just had to. I just had to put that together somehow. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm actually like I'm I'm going to death for that one because I mean I um, uh, I, you know, uh, what I will do is um, uh, I. I want to sort of like tie together something that you know Sejal said with what you know uh you know with what Umid and and, and Mariam said as well which is uh, I think these dif different programs have different goals and and um you know different kinds of citizen citizen science programs uh try to achieve different things some at local level some at global level some for outreach some for data uh but you know increasingly it is being recognized that that um a lot of citizen science programs were started initially you know with by sort of the science community for for gathering data at larger spatial and temporal scales uh, and that is something that you know certainly it can be used for because you know um, you have um, um, uh, you have people that are resident in areas over a long time you can you can you know bring many thousands of more people onto the you know onto a platform than you know than you can hire researchers uh, but i actually sort of want to really emphasize that what you know Sejal and uh, you know her colleagues and Emily um, are doing uh, in terms of uh, using a program like that to to create outreach to create uh, sort of uh, uh, sensitivity to you know one's environment to create those like links uh, that in a sense might still be the most important purpose that you know these citizen science programs uh, serve uh, when we started a students group for total conservation in chennai in 1988 and that sort of gives the game away uh, <laughs> uh you know um I, i was very small then uh <laughs> uh we didn't think of it as a citizen science program that term didn't exist you know but uh from 15 20 years before that rom witticker and others had been conducting turtle walks already and and they started out by getting their friends and you know uh other enthusiasts to go out of these beaches and 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 pat patrol the beaches and collect eggs and put them in a hatchery and so on and what that's done for you know for turtles over the last 50 years in in india in a sense is is quite remarkable if you go to you know any state in india you'll find some turtle conservation group uh if you go and ask them how they started uh many of them link back to either somebody who was associated with the program in chennai you know it's like I, i met this person i was inspired by him i read a newspaper article about you know the student sea turtle conservation network something or the other so the, that little seed that you know that was planted in the 70s that grew into this students network uh, really has been what has pretty much uh, inspired all of all of sea turtle conservation along along india's coast so uh, it wasn't called citizen science then but it but it, it that that really was what it what it, it shows us what citizen science uh, is capable of uh, of doing uh, for um, you know for uh, spreading ideas about marine conservation now you take that and you add social media to it uh i'd like to think it's like you know it it's a bit like pouring kerosene on a fire right which is like it it could be a good thing 
but <laughs> I'm going to say that you're going to want to, I'm, I'm an old fashioned guy. So, I mean, not everybody <laughs> would agree with me, but I'm going to, I'm going to say that social media good leads to good things and bad things like everything else. Right. And it really depends on how you use it. Uh, so the potential is, is, is fantastic. Um, um, base is there, but um, uh, I think it depends on where you want to go. Uh, Sejal, you guys are sort of, it's, it's MLOM to the rest of pe the people in the country outside Bombay is essentially being a social media sort of outreach, right? So can you shed some light as to, do you see, have there been challenges? Do you think there could be challenges by putting together citizen science and social media in the same space? Yes, I think uh, what Kartik said is so important here because it's how you use it, right? So, because when I spoke about the team coming together in the beginning, uh, it looks really, uh, we always knew and I'm also extremely old fashioned and uh, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I'm always very cognizant of the fact that even if a medium that you use is casual, um, maybe you can take care to make sure that your information is not. So, um, I completely agree with what Karthik said in terms of how we use social media. So how you use any sort of outreach. So if somebody has to write a post, for example, uh, there's writing, you read five things before that, you read papers before that, it gets fact-checked, it goes up. And then the most treacherous line of all, One right? One hopes it gets fact-checked. Huh? Sorry? One hopes it gets fact-checked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fully. No, no, I'm I'm fully uh, a slave driver in the in the team, so it has to get fact checked. Like somebody somewhere has to look at it, and uh, <laughs> the guys are here, and they'll probably they'll probably sit like this. But I think in that sense, I think we just make sure that whatever goes out uh, at least is accurate, and also that weird. That's what I was saying. The treacherous line between um, making it relatable and having it accurate um, is really is really tough. But, and we don't always manage it, but it probably is something that we've been able to harness well. So I have to also say in terms of, and we are all using, uh, and I'm so glad that Karthik brought that up because that term didn't exist so, uh, a, a while ago and now it does. And even now it's so layered. Um, it means different things in different contexts, right? So for example, in, in terms of an active participation and an open, open participation like MLOM, it's also, we have to be cognizant that it is transitory for some people. Uh, while citizen participation and citizen interest and well-meaning enthusiasm, it's also sometimes only till then, like there will be some engagement and then they might choose to move on, which is completely okay. And is something that we need to factor into our communication programs that we make that little time count. So that person carries that nugget forward, no matter where, even if they don't engage with us anymore. Because citizen, I mean, it, you cannot expect everybody who engages with you to stay. I think they will engage with you because they are passionate about that particular thing. And then they will take what they want and then they might, you know, move on to other things. And there's so much more that I think now citizen science, since it's become a term about who owns data and data ownership and all of those things. I think we're only now starting to look at uh, so much of that. So uh, it is not without challenges for sure. But I think despite all of that, Yes, I definitely agree with you on the aspect that it's um, certainly worth it. In fact, I can't say that I, I can easily say that I'm connected to some of the people on this panel itself only through social media. Like I would have never known for uh, social media, right? So it is definitely um, something that I think, as you say, can be used both for uh, for good and evil. So uh, I'm going to take a question from the audience here. We have a question from Akila, uh, and it's particularly for Umid. Uh, and she asks, um, what sort of environmental degradation have you witnessed in your decades of diving? And what is your primary concern or worry when it comes to conservation or the lack thereof? I've seen uh, changes in everything from fish population. So therefore, obviously, how much fishing is happening, what species are getting targeted, then substrate and uh, topographic and bottom, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, composition related changes. So whether we're going from healthy coral reefs to damaged coral reefs or healthy coral reefs to coral reefs, which are now significantly covered in algae. Um, so in that regard, there have been multiple 
uh, you know, changes in, uh, uh, if, if you look at the Andamans, for example, in the last uh, 10 years, you know, there are these trends for uh, fishing and you have shark fishermen that come from uh, the Th Tamil Nadu coastline and fish in the Andamans, for example. Uh, so then you have the very, uh, uh, you know, uh, a particular case of what's happening with, in the Lakshadweep with the pole and line fishermen uh, and, and uh, you know, their entire fishing reality. Uh, so the way what the, the 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 you know things that one hears from a global perspective of uh, uh, fish stocks and uh, climate change and uh, you know uh, bleaching and those kind of things they all happen uh, around india as well whether we are as aware or whether we are less aware based on again the numbers of people going out and actually seeing these things is uh, going to be different from different other parts of the world let's say the bombarding of news that comes out of for example the great barrier reef but uh, that is, again, simply because of just differences in lifestyle, differences in how much time we spend in the water and things like that. Uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, what is your primary worry when it comes to conservation or the lack of it? My primary worry, uh, I would say, is the non-consultation with local stakeholders and people on the ground who... See, I'll tell you something. <laughs> As divers and as recreational divers, we uh, uh, inhabit or, or, or uh, overlap this space purely from an entertainment and recreational perspective. Let's be very honest with the recreational diving community about this. Uh, there are other people whose livelihoods, whose resources, uh, you know, are uh, much more in, entrenched in that space. And so uh, if I had to point out one thing that I find uh, problematic with these larger ideas of conservation and things like that, and, and you see them as stumbling blocks in many places where conservation initiatives haven't been as successful, it is uh, that uh, the local stakeholder and the person on the ground, the community on the ground, that local fishing village or this, uh, uh, you know, uh, place that is now going to be taken over for fish shrimp farming, etc. The people there are not consulted their uh, ideas and uh, their solutions that they have been practicing for generations passed down from uh, solutions of sustainable, uh, uh, let's say, resource management and use, uh, relatively speaking, compared to our, let's go and trawl this space or whatever, those things are not taken into consideration. And so uh, the, the local stakeholder, uh, the fishing communities, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who have been using that space and know it to the like the back of their hands to the point where uh, even simple things like okay on at this time of the year I'm going to use this particular kind of net because I'm going to target only that kind of uh, or, or that group of fish and then uh, two months later I'm going to use a different kind of net so that I can target these shrimp that degree of resource management that degree of understanding of a space is already in existence and uh, the people who are the uh, ball bearers of that knowledge are the local uh, communities uh, on the ground who are who are using these spaces not for their entertainment but for their livelihoods so we need to listen to those uh, people a lot better we need and 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 dakshin has already been doing this uh, you know for for years now and i had the amazing opportunity of working with arti to document some of her work along the tamil nadu coastline and those are the voices that need to be made louder that is my uh, uh, that is my one concern with conservation uh, if i had to if i had to point out one concern yeah i think that is definitely something that most of us um, on the panel as well as the audience would agree that um, we need to look at conservation as more of an inclusive model like what Karthik had earlier mentioned than it's something that involves removing people who are dependent on an ecosystem from that very ecosystem. And that's that's not going to work. You are not going to be able to sustain that. Uh, you're going to piss people off. You're going to, uh, you know, be at loggerheads constantly with the, at the end of the day, the people whose land and waters it is, you know, if, mm -hmm. if one had to stake a claim to it. So. I completely, does anyone else on the panel want to pitch in on that uh, one trajectory of thought? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, uh, as India, we love making laws and uh, uh, especially uh, like globally, 
marine protected areas are considered as panacea for marine conservation so anyone wants to look at marine conservation they look at marine protected area and that's a there's a lot of global emphasis on uh, setting up more marine protected areas but the question is that uh, as mid rightly said that it, it doesn't affect us directly because we sit in bangalore or mumbai or wherever we are at at, at this moment but it really impacts the uh, people who depend on the uh, resources and uh, livelihood is dependent so even this whole marine conservation model uh, should be should go beyond marine protected areas and it should be of a inclusiveness where there is a community driven uh, models even th uh, those should be explored uh, of course there is uh, uh, in india currently there are is only one a uh, community reserve and uh, while we have on paper we have 136 marine protected areas and in uh, recently three new got declared in lakshadweep the real question that one should ask is that uh, how many of them are effective uh, on paper we have we are doing wonders we have this many protected areas but are, are they effective is there compliance is there um, uh, are they uh, useful and that is something not even it's not even question it's not even considered so as in a country we make laws we set up marine protected area and we we uh, forget about it uh, so i think that's uh, not useful at all uh, that's what um, yeah i i completely agree in that front is that we need to take a good hard look as well as as to whether cons any conservation model is actually effective because it's very easy to say i'm doing this as as uh, india is doing this india is doing that but actually to to critique our own selves is the hardest part here now again uh, sorry to sort of delve away from the current um, questions we are getting a lot of questions from the audience so i will start taking it now uh, we have a question from pratiti who wants to know how diving dive tourism has affected the habitats of places like andamans and especially mariam would be been diving especially in the andamans for the past 8 9 years so i think this goes to you thank you uh yeah so that question is actually very directly related to something that umit said that um, whether it's conservation whether it is tourism whatever it is uh I would like to believe I'm a local because I've been living there for X number of years. But at the end of the day, I still have this lovely place in mainland, right? I I I can still disconnect from the realities of of life in a place like the Andamans, good and bad, both. Um. So yes, there's the obvious thing of garbage and 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 the complete lack that people have of respecting another place, like. as indians everything is a backyard right but um, what we have started seeing recently is the effect of tourism on on the environment is one thing but the effect of tourism on the local communities and the people is honestly a bigger concern right because uh, these are people that are very simple in, in their ideologies very simple in their in their lifestyles they're very simple in the way they live um uh and the more time you spend with them you realize that the information that they're getting now is coming from the people that they're seeing coming in to their land right uh, in, into their backyards into their uh, into their sea into their onto their roads and when they see somebody callously just throw something or spit somewhere or disrespect something it it because it, they seeing other indians do it at the end of the day right and the, what they are taking away from it is not necessarily very good the the younger generation and this is something that i know that kartik is going to agree with me especially with one of the communities that dakshin works very closely with umeed has worked with uh now uh, rahul and i are working with in north andaman uh or trying to work with um is that they have seen a new way of living life where they can make money fast where they can buy things where they can do all of these things that were not easily accessible to them earlier and these things honestly are going against the andamans in terms of how it's affecting the environment and how it is affecting these communities directly 
and and for people that come from the outside it's all good right like uh, i'm going to use very small simple examples like having a drink it's all very good to sit and have a drink and you're like oh we are so cool we can have a drink and whatever nonsense but for these people you're changing their ideology towards how life should be lived so they're, they're moving away from things that they are the stakeholders of which is looking after the environment making sure that the rivers are clean making sure that the seas are clean making sure that uh, at the end of the day diving is is great it's a lot of fun but if you're not going to do it respectfully if if you're going to go under water and you're going to see more garbage and you're going to see people spitting and throwing things and disregarding it very soon something that you're making money out of is going to cease to exist so that that relationship of understanding what it means to to put the two together in, in a balanced form is is becoming lesser and lesser with time and i'm sure from when i moved there kartik and umid have been there much longer than i have they have there's a very clear deterioration in 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 the kind of people that are coming how it's affecting the locals and how the locals are reacting to it now so their attitude is also becoming chalega it's okay you know let's live for today we'll see when tomorrow comes which i think is is the downfall of tourism in a place like the andamans for 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 various reasons not just the sea even land and most importantly for the locals it's it's not the i mean you you have we have the opportunity to make a positive impact and that's what we're working on with like you know educational programs working with them talking with them living with them but it's it's a long long road and we don't have the same crowd of people coming in like we used to now anybody can come anywhere it's accessible to anybody so how do you control that you know how, what kind of information are you going to pass on what do you do to sort of control that is is what personally is what we are working on or trying to work on and i yes yeah, sorry i hope that answers the question more or less i i think it kind of does because we're not just talking here about um uh, the ecological impact but also the impact on the local communities and that further driving the ecological impact that diving and tourism uh, brings to pristine or once pristine ecosystems uh, like yeah. andaman now um we are also getting quite a few questions about the how how divers can contribute positively to whether it's coral coral restoration and i'm going to read out some of the questions here i don't have time to read out all of them because a lot of them have a uh, similar sort of uh, similar question essentially um are there any other uh, initiatives such as what we are working on with reflog that are currently active along the indian coastline focusing on coral restoration or conservation that are open to diver participation if yes which ones and if no uh, also what are some of the obstacles to an increased focus on coral restoration and marine protected pro protected area programs in the indian conservation landscape um this is by harsha i think harsha badan has already answered your question as to obstacles in terms of uh, focusing mostly on marine protected areas when we're talking about coral restoration i think uh, i have a like one small point to make here is that yes there is an increased focus today in uh, whether it's terms of building artificial reefs or building or or uh, involving coral restoration in form in the form of coral transplantation and yes i do think they are useful and um, important areas that we need to explore because the fact is that uh, we have come to a point where we require um, a situation where we have to restore our coral reefs however having said that it's very important to remember that uh, we have to keep in mind that artificial reefs and coral restoration and habitat restoration in the, in the marine space is still very much in its research phase we have not yet collected enough data as a scientific community to go out there and say that hey this is a 100% working model which is what vardhan had brought up earlier in terms of we have to really look into terms of what conservation models are working and what isn't and this is why we need more people working in conservation together not just the scientists so i hope i have been able to share a little bit of light in terms of coral restoration but moving towards um other questions that we've had from akila harsha and quite a, and um mars as well and uh, quite a few of you 
is um, how can divers who don't have technical expertise in conservation or marine biology actually contribute to marine conservation and increase their knowledge in marine biology. I would like to direct this to Kartik because we've been working for a while now in this very question, in trying to answer this very question. So um, over to you, Kartik, if you want to give our participants a quick view as to what we are trying to do to involve you guys as recreational divers in conservation actively. Right, uh, thanks, Sunaya. So actually that, um you know, brings us, you know, we've mentioned reef log in the passing a few times. Uh, and uh, reef log was actually a citizen science uh, pilot initiative that was um, uh, sort of uh, started in a very small way in the Andamans about four or five years ago by um, uh, one of our colleagues at Dakshin, Mahima Jaini, uh, with the dive centers in, in Havelock. And it's kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, hibernated or incubated or <laughs> whatever for, for a couple of years uh, now. But uh, we are in the process of sort of launching it at a much larger scale through the Andamans uh, and the East Coast as well as the West Coast uh, in, the next, um, in the next few weeks, actually. Um, a part of that is through a partnership with, uh, with SSI India, to whom we're, uh, you know, I'd like to acknowledge their role in sort of helping us promote this. Um, and uh, uh, however, I mean, I think it's a partnership that we're gonna have with whichever dive centers and dive organizations uh, would, like to, uh, would like to partner with us on. Um, uh, we've been working closely with uh, divers such as um, uh, Mariam and Rahul and uh, where Umid already expressed enthusiasm about it. So we're assuming that he's going to be an active, uh, you know, an active consultant and advisor. Um, and I think in a way it's, I, I think we'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of give a shout out to MLO here by saying that if we can achieve what you've done at that scale, you know, uh, I, I, in Mumbai, it's those principles that we'd like to sort of like promote uh, further inside the water away <laughs> beyond intertidal. So like right, uh, uh, right down to, you know, as far as recreational divers can go, uh, but sort of at a, at a larger scale. But what we, what, what we really are hoping to learn from you is what you managed to be successful with uh, in terms of your, uh, you know, your values and what, and the uh, networks and the communities that you've built. Uh, Anything that MLM can do to help, uh, we are here yeah. in support. And we will take you up on that. Uh, Suneha, <laughs> uh, actually, sort of apart from moderating this discussion, she's actually the, been the coordinator of that uh, program, and we'll, we'll of course sort of follow up. But for the rest of the audience, I think, especially those of you who are divers and want to be, you know, uh, and, and aspiring divers uh, in the group and want to be more engaged, this is actually a program that's designed for uh, divers who are not marine biologists to make a contribution. Uh, so we've uh, we've designed it in a way that. Uh, that divers with a certain amount of experience and comfort in the water uh, can collect data on 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 what are what would otherwise just be fun dives, uh, and that data can sort of go into a larger system. Uh, it will go into a database online, uh, similar to you know India Biodiversity Portal and uh, iNaturalist and so on, eBird and all of these uh, on a website that will again be launched in a few weeks, which I, which will be called Reeflog uh, org. Uh, so it's really uh, sort of the first step towards someone getting involved with marine conservation. Instead of just doing a fun dive, you actually have a slate with, you know, with images of common species and you can collect data on those and contribute that to a website and then become part of a community. And this, we hope, will also lead to further, you know, more steps in, in engagement, uh, both in terms of individuals becoming sort of more involved with uh, marine conservation and marine, you know, marine monitoring, uh, but also sort of like a horizontal spread that like, you know, more and more people can become participants in, you know, in a, in a program like this. Uh, that's sort of the quick, quick blurb, right? So Neha, was there anything else about Reflog that we want to sort of like tell them? I mean, you're the one I who's think... taking the boxes, so you should, maybe you should add it. <laughs> uh, I think Karthi, you pretty much covered uh, what our mentality and idea is behind Reflog and this is sort of also our way to reach out to the diving community and extend sort of um, arms of collaboration. So I just want to quickly add uh, as an addendum to what Kartik said, you know, uh, and what Vardhan pointed out earlier is that 
scientists have been diving quite recently and you know we have sort of managed to make a few partnerships within the dive community but uh, what we really would like is to go beyond making partnerships with just dive operators and dive centers and really extend that hand out to pretty much anyone and everyone who just wants to enter the water you know whether you guys want to go for a dive with mariam or umid tomorrow just to see the ocean uh, that could potentially sort of motivate you into participating in a program like this where you know you go and actually record whatever you see you know then it goes from uh, just doing a dive to similar work that mlom and sejal's team has been doing in actually recording everything uh, that you see during your dive and that is what will sort of drive the conservation community and the science community into actionable things that will help us understand our own ecosystems a lot better um now moving on uh, to yeah, one uh, one one thing which is that you know i i just want to put on my scientist hat for a moment and you know i i, I wrote an article of you know like a few weeks ago on the scroll about how scientists need to sort of come out of their ivory towers and engage more with with the public i mean science is really a problem of the last i mean, I mean that that as science gets more technological the more in ivory towers it stays the more detrimental it is to society in many ways and i i don't just mean this about conservation i mean about science in general uh and i so i see citizen science as you know we've talked about it I, I, earlier both both sejal and i sort of uh, you know un, sort of un, un uh, wittingly talked about it as a way to sensitize citizens to you know the environment but i also see citizen science as a bridge between science and civil society right and we need to talk to each other more because scientists need to need on the one hand to you know to be more engaged with society to communicate their science better and on the other hand we need civil society to be more you know to what um uh, no no political sort of like uh, um affinities there but to you know uh, develop what you know what uh, you know nehru used to call a scientific temple right and that was sort of one of the bases on which the modern modern india was set up uh, which is what we owe our you know uh, some of our significant scientific and technological advances to uh, but none of that can really you know i think happen unless we're able to sort of build those build those bridges between civil society and the scientific community so that's one more thing that i goal that i think that for me as a scientist and for vardhan surely uh, is that we let sort of want to build this two way uh, bridge between the between the communities and in keeping with that i think that if one really wants to push the effectiveness of reef log uh, then beyond just the execution of uh, you know these beautiful slates and data collection that you guys are talking about if let's say after the one year mark you could have somebody like kartik or somebody like suneha or somebody like navin who can look at this data even though it might just be one years worth of data collection you might start to see certain trends or you might start to be able to extrapolate certain trends and i feel that if there can be that engagement which uh, basically says that here you guys help collect all this data let me tell you a little bit about it and let me tell you a little bit about what your oceans uh, what is happening in your own backyard and if if you can have the diving community uh, uh, you know uh, 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 be addressed by somebody who is looking at this data from a from a scientific perspective i think the value then is automat automatically catapulted beyond uh, uh, you know yeah yeah i'm going to uh, for a second and, and, and agree with umeed because I, I saw the first time it was launched, right? Like I, I remember taking those slates on the water. I remember giving them to my open water students, and I remember giving them to my advanced divers. And uh, I remember Rahul sitting us down and saying, like, guys, this is what we need to do. But his his point that at the end of collecting that data, like when we put in that work, we didn't. I mean, it was fun, yes. But after a while, um, as dive professionals, you tend to tune out because there's already so much else going on. but if we could do this we could do more of these things like we are today right where we involve the people who are who who are the scientific minds behind this uh, this program this initiative then it becomes much nicer for the divers and it and the diving community to say okay you know what this is what this has amounted to and therefore it keeps it going and it, and it doesn't phase out or doesn't you know simmer off into the unknown darkness like it happened the last time so yeah it, it, it would make a bigger a stronger impact so to say yeah yes i think that you guys have made that really important point in terms of us communicating that data back 
to the citizen scientists and not just taking the data and uh, you know just keeping it in a repository but actually giving back that information to the public in a way that they can understand now taking a quick sort of detour from what we've been discussing now we have a pretty interesting question on uh, the chat box here from karan who wants to know should there be censorship within social media driven citizen science as the panel pointed out anything you put out there can have positive and negative consequences censorship could be pertaining to protected species exotic animals or mega fauna i think maybe uh, sejal since you are i think the most prolific uh, social media user amongst us would you <laughs> mind uh, giving us your thoughts on this oh, okay um so yes of course i think once uh, you start putting out uh, information that might be uh, sensitive you are definitely opening um, you are opening it up to a larger audience um but in in this particular case and i don't want to generalize this because i don't know enough about that but <laughs> in what i discovered in mlom's uh, case is that uh, a lot of those things were already happening uh, before see social media is actually not something that uh, uh, that starts something it's something that gives you that information of something that is already happening so in in the sense that uh, we saw a lot of these uh, say for example vulnerable species um that there was already um, some sort of um uh, say not very good behavior happening with those species already and uh, what it gave us a chance to do is actually have those conversations there as well but i would definitely say that uh, do we are we careful about what we post on social media knowing that that might be sensitive information that might go out to people yes for sure uh, a lot of the information that i think uh, we think will be contributing to science we sometimes don't put on social and we put on inat so definitely going back to what kartik said i think um, i'm not so sure censorship is uh, something i mean especially in today's world it's a big trigger for me so i don't think that that is uh, that sort of thing i mean i would not definitely want um, censorship in any of those things but i think there should be some sensitivity uh, discerning uh, from organizations themselves when they want to put out something you always have to understand that there are all sorts of people all sorts of, and it can have far reaching effects in every possible manner so if that sort of filter is there and which is why again going back to the team that is internal if your internal team is very um, uh diverse and there are multiple voices that can add to this thing it really will help your communication when it goes outside instead of one specific mindset that says ye to mujhe bahar dalna hi hai but there might be somebody who says kare mat dal yaar don't do this because it might lead to so i'm not for censorship in anything um so i would for me personally this is not an mlom stand uh i'm just not for something uh, communication to be censored but i do think discerning uh, you have to be discerning on social media and this can go to everything like i also feel and this is something that i think i don't know kartik if you meant uh, also when you talked about social media and um a, a lot of the kind of cap things that we put on social media are for um, you know likes and we want to take the best photos and we want to take the best um we want to be uh, we want to have those 1000 views and the 10000 likes and all of those things but in that sense i think when you uh, what are you doing to the ecosystem that you're in and that is entirely a different panel discussion that uh, can go on for a while but how do you best um when you when you take something that you're going to put out how do you best take it without disturbing something uh without putting your mark on something that is probably not so easy to wipe off um disturb the animal keep your distance all of those things i think men and that is those are the things i'm more worried about when we talk of social media rather than censorship and what can happen because i think a lot of those things already do exist i think what i do worry about is um what means you are taking and what your intentions are to put things up uh, on social i think i would actually urge teams to con continue to think about when they put these citizen science projects out and this is something that we do on our walks as well to try and tell them that it's really nice to have a great photo but it's also really nice to have a photo that might challenge you instead of challenging the animal so better your skill a little bit try not to try not to do ultimately they're going to do what they're going to do but i think that kind of communication is also as important um on the ground 
uh, and in your immediate vicinity, and then you hope that it's going to stick. I don't that know is... if that adequately answers that. I want question. to I want to bring one point up over here. Um, and i think in terms of the conundrum of regarding censorship and all of that sejal uh, you know hit the nail on the head uh, so to speak but the reason i brought up social media uh, a few questions back or a little while ago is uh, because okay forget facebook as a platform and what it does forget instagram as a platform and what it does but just now if i google if i hashtag a bioluminescence and karnataka on instagram okay i'm just giving you an example the repository of information is absurd it's literally absurd so i'm not when i was bringing up social media earlier yes that is one manner in which dissemination happens interest is garnered etc cetera, etc cetera. but from a scientist from a back end perspective if somebody could program a scrubber that let's say i want to know about blennies uh, in the intertidal zone during this time of this algal bloom uh, if i have certain hashtags that i know that i'm looking for uh and and i can write a program that is going to pull this information for me off of facebook and instagram i'm suddenly sitting on uh you know citizen science data so so you know these are tools they're very powerful tools and they will always yeah. have a detriment to them but yeah. as as sejal and karthik have already pointed out it's how you choose to use it and and i feel and this is one of the reasons i'm excited about reflog because if reflog in its next phase gets digital and in its next phase gets applicable where we are writing an app and and you have this amazing thing that you can now just say to somebody who wants to know about a certain species off the tamil nadu coastline here you go boss this is all the information you know so so it's a it's a it's a it's a double edged sword but i i feel that uh, from a data uh, collection and uh, there is huge potential which is still going relatively untapped i again as i am repeating like a parrot i completely agree with you um i'm also going to now take a bit of a detour from the flow of co the conversation or to address some more of the questions on the chat box because because we are running out of time i'm afraid this is the last question that we'll have time to answer on the panel but i just want to remind the audience that um we will make sure that we answer all the questions and maybe send out an email or communicate it to you after the panel discussion is over so this is a question from desi to the entire panel uh from my limited experience they may they may sometimes be conflicts between recreational diving industries and other local stakeholders when it comes to the use of coastal habitats do you think joint citizen science projects here could help reduce these conflicts and how it's an open question so whoever wants to uh, respond first can go for it umid since uh, you've been doing this longest how about you start and we'll follow sorry sometimes we conflicts between the recreational diving industries and local other local stakeholders when it comes to the use of coastal habitats so i i have to uh, desi i'll try and hi it's nice to see you <laughs> i'll try and get you the study uh, that i was looking at but there was an example of uh, and again i'm also on the same page with vardhan with regards to the notification of marine protected areas and keeping people out of the equation but uh, i have seen a, or, or i have come across literature where there are examples of uh, citizen science programs uh, Uh, that have been conducted by diving uh, operators who have been allowed into no take zones so marine protected areas which then uh, uh, led to the management of those areas in such a way that they could then benefit the local uh, uh, fishing uh, communities as well so uh, and i think this was one uh, the, the literature the 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 study that i was reading uh, was off of new zealand if i'm not mistaken but i'll try and find that and dig that up but um, i think that, that it definitely has the potential uh, to uh, kind of um, overcome some of these these conflicts because to if 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 one was to look at uh, the fact that a diver and again we are 
you know, our use of the marine space, I would say, is the least important. But let's say we want a pretty fish, a pretty reef with lots of fish. Uh, technically, that's a condition that would uh, benefit a fisherman as well. He wants a lot of fish because uh, for his community, that's a condition that's going to benefit them. And so I think there is potential to uh, guide citizen science programs in such a way. And uh, I think very briefly, Naveen himself uh, in his talk for Scuba Evolution had given this example of uh, setting up a citizen science program for this village in uh, Tamil Nadu, where uh, the villagers themselves, uh, uh, you know, started to monitor the reefs, uh, the, the beach uh, that they that their village was uh, situated on. Mm -hmm. And by the data that they collected, they proved that uh, there was uh, sand dune ecosystems in a place where uh, the new coal plant uh, that was supposed to come into that area and the environmental impact assessment of that was that there were there are no useful ecosystems over here and so you have examples where uh, citizen science has definitely contributed to uh, the betterment of the local stakeholder community in either fighting a case or reclaiming certain rights etc cetera, etc cetera. kartik will i'm sure be able to tell you more Yeah, I mean, I think I agree that that you know that uh, part of the problem is that we tend to look at these as zero sum games. You know, somebody wins, somebody loses, but that's not necessarily the you know it is a zero sum game as far as as far as you know Earth and our you know resources are concerned. But in terms of how we how we engage with them, I think there are ways to do it that are beneficial to you know uh, civil society as as well as local communities as as well as you know. The tire industry and so on. Uh, uh, as as Umid rightly said, the the dive community is really a sort of thin slice of the pie, uh, and uh, perhaps you know uh, has not always uh, you know has has not always had the bigger picture in mind when they've when they've gone. I mean, it is an industry. People who start these businesses are thinking of of them in terms of like of uh, of of revenue and income, right? Um, it's like trawling and, and artisanal fishing. Uh, artisanal fishers have fished in these areas for like for centuries or longer. Should uh, you know had various you know marine resource use regimes, many traditional management systems, and so on. And the guys that came in with trawlers, um, and we worked on this uh, you know in in parts of India such as Orissa. Uh, the key fact there is that the people who owned the tribe, the, the trawlers were businessmen from either Bhubaneswar or, or even like Punjab and Haryana, you know, and so it was not even the fact that trawling is a bad thing, which it is, but it's the fact that like their entire engagement with that industry was just as an industry. It had nothing to do with fishing as such, right? And uh, so uh, I, I think what, you know, we're all able to come to the table, you know, with that, with a common understanding of what our goal is as we absolutely rightly said at the end of the day you know the the dive industry the, you know from the dive tourism perspective uh the, the fishermen um uh, and all of the other stakeholders uh you know right down to if we can put our hats on and we're actually like one one part of us we're just like urban city dwellers who you know till day before yesterday in the scheme of things were not engaged with these ecosystems at all right uh but we can also get sort of the, the the end that we want if we're if we're willing to work together and also recognize each other's uh, you know uh, philosophies and perspectives and you know, I, I try to emphasize this all the time that uh, that uh, I'll, I'll tell the story again which is you know I, when I say when I say I love turtles everybody assumes that I love turtles I love watching turtles I love studying turtles I love reading about turtles I love writing about turtles when I say I love fish. Uh, could be that I love watching them, could be that I love eating them, right? Um, and my point is not that we should think about fish the way we think about turtles, but we should think about turtles the way we think about fish. That we really need to recognize that that different people come with different perspectives and, you know, and, and emotions and engagements with the environment. And if we're able to respect that and find solutions that, you know, that negotiate across these these spaces, I think, you know, um, I think we can all achieve the goals we want. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add here as a, as, as a diver for, for a moment. Um, in my experience, uh, I think that fishing communities in general 
are very welcoming. If there is a need to make anybody sensitive, it is the dive industry and it is the dive professionals because at the rate at which we're churning them out, we are forgetting to put across a very important message. We are supposed to be the advocators of the marine environment in a very simple way, right? We are not cowboys. It is a job. We're supposed to do this with dignity and with respect. And this respect is not only to the local stakeholders, it is to the environment in itself, underwater and on the surface, right? So with, with something like reef log, you, it, it sort of brings back what a lot of divers, when I came to diving, it was because I couldn't leave the country to become a marine biologist for whatever reasons. And which is why this was the next best thing to me, the closest that I could be to conservation. In the case of uh, Rahul, he is a marine biologist, but unfortunately at the time that he came to the field, there was just too much going on in the world and the only way he could stay close to the environment was by becoming a diver, right? Now the reason why people are becoming dive professionals is from easy job, cool lifestyle, uh, living on an island, uh, uh, partying, all sorts of things. So the, the, the reasons are becoming much more diluted. So something like a reef lock program or something like what Karthik is talking about or even Umit spoke about, it is, I think, from the point of view of if there is anybody that needs to be made more sensitive to the situation, it's us, the diving community. Then, then the local fishing community. The local fishing community knows exactly what they're doing. They've been doing this for eons, right? They, they understand when to go out, what to fish, how not to do it. So this, this particular program actually is is something that I'm really happy that it's coming back is, is because it's reminding us, the divers, that listen, you're here, but understand that you're here for a reason. And that reason goes beyond teaching somebody how to breathe underwater and go look at fish. So in that regard, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, self-improvement and self-reflection that we, the dive professionals, need to sort of start doing because uh, we, we are adding to the negative impact of, of what we're doing to our environment. It's, it's, it's like Umid said, we're a very, very small percentage. We have to be very realistic about what it is that we do. It's not rocket science. Sorry, I think as much as I believe it would be very exciting to continue with these conversations, it's unfortunately six o'clock and I think people will start getting angsty if I keep them uh, glued to their computers any longer. So I would like to uh, thank all of you for all the interesting questions from the audience and once again I would like to remind you that if we have not had the time to address them there are some questions that you have all asked for particular speakers. I will ensure that we collate these answers and uh, send this to you uh, within the coming week. And uh, thank you for these really useful suggestions and contributions and uh, all the sharing that's been happening in the chat box as well. And of course, a huge thanks to all of our panelists today from Vardhan to hi for highlighting the work that um, the Marine Conservation Group is doing and as well as um, the need for data as scientists to Kartik to putting together all the pieces of what we are all trying to do here today, as well as, of course, Mariam and Umid with their extremely useful um, and very realistic ideas of what diving really is and what diving can really achieve. And of course, for Sejal for uh, being sort of the way that we will also be following in terms of how MLOM has engaged with a lot of citizens and how we as Reeflog also want to continue doing the same. Um, we do want to let you all know that we will be bringing out more information about Reeflog in the coming months. We will be talking more about how you can participate, so please stay tuned for that. And of course, uh, all of these updates will definitely be happening on the Dakshin Foundation page, so please uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, of course, last but not least, I would really, really like to thank SSI India for partnering with us for Reeflog uh, at large, for helping us bring this um, this uh, program to the dive community as well as helping us throughout the process. Special thanks goes out to Siddharth from uh, SSI India for um, being with us uh, for the past few months, um, you know, helping us reach out to divers across the country. Um, so a last and final thank you to everyone here. Thanks for attending. I hope you have a great weekend. 
and um, I hope uh, you all have, we have also been able to learn from you as much as um, we've discussed amongst each other here today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you See you. Thank you. Bye.